Hi, need a ride? Hop on in. I'm headed to Julia's Trucking Cafe. Come on, let's go. We made it just in time. Come on, let's go get a seat. <laughs> hey, everybody, welcome to Julia's Trucking Cafe. Everybody, have a seat, get something to drink. How's everybody's weeks been? Well, if you stay tuned and you're not on Facebook, you'll find out toward the end of the show how my week has been. So now just sit back and enjoy the show. As always, I have lots of news to get to, so let's get right to it. Guys with hammer and a rope rescue a truck driver who, quote, intentionally drove into flood water. A local reporter was on hand to document a dramatic rescue of a truck driver from Texas floodwaters. This was reported on September 19th. The incident was filmed and shared by a uh, Houston reporter Melissa Correa Correa maybe on Thursday afternoon the truck driver later said that he was on his way to pick up a load and that no one had told him about the flooding uh yeah you kind of go into it and it starts getting up past the step um yeah that's a little bit deep hello uh the flood waters were up past the guy's windshield And they're standing on the airfoil on the visor uh, above the windshield. You can see it below a bridge. Uh, It looked like he jackknifed. Really, you know. And um, I'm kind of recording this early in the morning. So my kitty had plenty of sleep. So she decides she's going to run around the truck all morning. So if you hear some crashing and that kind of thing, that's my cat doing laps around the truck. But anyway, let's get back to the news. A crash decimates a semi-truck and downs a highway sign. A two-vehicle crash caused a spectacular amount of damage and will close a North Carolina interstate until th- that afternoon. The, it happened around Asheville, North Carolina on Friday. This was Friday, September 20th. Yes, I'm still playing. Apologize. I'm still playing catch-up and not the kind that goes on a hot dog. Police say that a semi-truck and a car were involved in a crash on eastbound I-40 near exit 53. The collision caused a highway sign to collapse onto the lanes of the interstate and no injuries have been reported. Eastbound I-40 was closed until around 3 p.m. that afternoon. What caused the crash is still under investigation, of course. A Texas bridge closed indefinitely after it was struck by multiple loose barges. Texas transportation officials say that they've shut down a major bridge until further notice after it was struck by barges overnight. All lanes of the I-10 East Freeway Bridge over the San Jacinto River are closed Friday morning. And this was, again, September 20th. After the structure was hit by at least two of the nine barges that broke loose on the river overnight. There appears to have been major structural damage to the bridge. Authorities are also concerned that barges underneath the bridge may contain combustible materials at that time. The Texas Department of Transportation isn't able to inspect the bridge because of high waters caused by Tropical Storm Imelda. Hmm, I missed that one. There is no estimated time for the bridge to reopen. Tolls are being waived at the same Houston Tollway Ship Channel Bridge because of the bridge closure. Transportation officials are detouring traffic off of I-10 at Magnolia and West Crosby, Lynchburg. In other news, flooding left Texas truck stop underwater and drivers were stranded. See, I missed all this. Back when it happened, of course. Many drivers shared surreal photos and videos of the submerged semis at the truck stop. Yeah, they're up. The water is up to the top step 
in, in the trailers. Dramatic video and photos posted to social media showed drivers stranded by flooding in Beaumont. On Thursday and Friday, a number of truckers shared images and video of submerged semis at Petro Truck Stop in Beaumont. Luckily, the floodwaters are tar- starting to recede, and many truckers report that they made their way out of the high water situation. Wow. Yeah, I'm sure glad I wasn't down there then. Goodyear is expected to pay $6.7 million after a tire explosion kills a commercial vehicle driver. A judge in New Orleans has ordered tire manufacturer Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company to pay out more than $6.7 million after the death of a garbage truck driver. On September 10, 2019, Judge Michael Clement awarded $6.73 million to the family of deceased garbage truck driver Edmund Bro Jr. An additional $481,075 was awarded to Plaquem and Parish. In February 2015, Bro and a family fellow employee, excuse me, and a fellow employee of the Solid Waste North Department of Plaquem and Parish Government was inflating a G182 tire after noticing that the tire pressure was low. Bro was holding the tire upright while inflating it when the tire sidewall ruptured. The force of the tire explosion threw Bro backwards and caused him to sustain major internal injuries in his chest and abdomen. Bro was hospitalized for 28 days before he passed away from injuries sustained during the tire explosion. During his hospitalization, he was in such pain that he had to be, quote, kept in restraints to keep him from pulling out the devices to which he had been hooked up, Clement wrote. They, you think, okay, let me stop a minute. Then you wonder why they didn't put him in medically induced in co- a coma or coma. You know, excuse me. So medically induced coma. You know, they do that to people all the time to to alleviate the pain. Why didn't they do that to him? The legal team representing Bro argued, quote, that the the tire company's warnings about zipper failure was misleading about the circumstances in which a tire could rupture. In addition, the warnings were never related to employees of the Solid Waste North Department of the Plaquemine Parish Government, end quote. Clement ruled that Goodyear, quote, Goodyear had not carried out its duty to warn Miss Bro and co-workers about the tire's dangers and how to avoid being injured, end quote. Quote, we are disappointed with the verdict and will appeal, end quote, a representative from Goodyear stated. Of course they do. They always appeal it because they don't want to pay millions of dollars, you know, and So, I never liked Goodyear tires anyway. So, in other news, semi steals door from a minivan that crossed over its lane. A possible distracted passenger vehicle driver narrowly avoids a head-on crash with a semi-truck in this dash cam video. Which will be in the article, like always, in the show notes under cafe menu and then you just go to show notes. The dash cam clip was shared by YouTube user Chuck and Z on September 17th. In the video, an oncoming minivan s- seems close to plowing head on into a semi truck traveling in front of the dash camera. Or, mi- or, or Chuck and Z. The minivan driver appears to correct at the last second and sideswipes the semi truck instead, losing a door in the process. Wow. You know, you just, I don't know, I don't know what this world's coming to, really don't. And a semi stuck on I-10 as far as anybody can see, again with this flooding that happened from that tropical storm. A rescue group shared frightening footage of long lines of semi-trucks stranded on, I try to say that fast, semi-trucks stranded on I-10 between Winnie and Beaumont, Texas. Um, The video shared by Louisiana Storm Patrol around noon on Friday, there again on September 20th. Uh, The video shows long lines of traffic, majority of vehicles appear to be semi-trucks, parked on the interstate with nowhere to go as far as the eye can see. In the video, the group says they were working to provide transport, food, water, or any other services to drivers who are stranded on the interstate due to the flooding that has decimated eastern and southeastern Texas over the past two days. Friday morning, the Texas Department of Transportation said that both directions of I-10 between Beaumont and Winnie remain closed and that there's no estimated time for the interstate to reopen. 
I-10 was closed in both directions. Um, and then an update, it was I-10 westbound traffic coming into uh, Beaumont detoured to U.S. 90 westbound. I-10 eastbound traffic from Houston detoured north on uh, State Highway 146 and Mont Bellevue and east on U.S. 90. Most east-west traffic signals along U.S. 90 have been changed to flashing yellow to assist traffic flow. I-10 East Freeway in Houston area is also closed until further notice that after that bridge damage. Oh, now you're going to... Now, this is a funny for this episode. You're going to die laughing at this story. Wait till you hear it. Truck, a truck driver bit a camel in his on his private area at a truck stop zoo. Okay, now, doing this for 30 years, I just, I thought I heard it all. Okay? Now I've read it all. OMG. A woman who was attempting to rescue her dog had a bizarre encounter with a camel at a Louisiana truck stop. The unusual incident occurred on Thursday, September 19th at the Tiger truck stop in Gross Tet, Louisiana. Okay, used to the Tiger truck stop used to have the Bengal Tigers. Well, they also have a llama. Um, the Iberville Parish Sheriff's Office says that the incident began when a Florida-based truck driver and her husband stopped at a truck stop to allow their deaf dog out of the truck. Can we say put it on a leash? As the husband tossed treats into the enclosure of Casper the camel at the truck stop zoo, the dog crawled under the fence and into the camel's cage to try to get the treats. The deaf dog did not respond to commands, hello, he's deaf, to leave the camel's cage. So the couple entered the enclosure and reportedly swatted at the camel while they tried to rescue the dog. Police say that somehow the agitated camel sat on the woman as she bent down to pick up her pet. Oh, I wish I could see that one. I wish I could be a fly on the cage. Trapped underneath the camel, the woman decided on an unusual tactic to defend herself. She actually bit him in his private area, and that's about as nice as he could get put, said Pamela uh, Balsier, Tiger Truck Stop Manager. Iberville Parish Sheriff's Department, Lewis Hamilton Jr. explained more clearly. She said, I bit his testicles to get him off of me. The woman was taken to the hospital for treatment of unknown injuries. Yeah, embarrassment. Casper was relatively uninjured. The truck driver and her husband reportedly cited for trespassing and leash law violations. Uh, Boussey discusses the incident inside Casper's pen in the video below that's going to be in the show notes. Unreal. Serves her for, right for getting sat on. They were in his area. They were trespassing. You know, get the hell out of my pen. You know, and take your dang dog with you. I'm like, really? You know, the deaf dog doesn't know any better. They, they're, you know, and you shouldn't be feeding the a, a, a camel anyway. No one said you could feed it. There's signs all over the place. Don't be feeding the camels. So I'm sorry, but it it served them right. Gee whiz, she's bitching about being sat on. I would have sat on her too and probably bit her back. Kentucky police announced a year-long... In other news, I'm sorry. Kentucky police announced a year-long interstate enforcement for cars and trucks. <gasps> Say it ain't so... Multiple law enforcement agencies in Kentucky will be kicking off a year-long driver force focused. I cannot talk this morning like it's like almost four o'clock in the morning when I'm recording this. In driver focused enforcement campaign, the campaign is scheduled to start on October 1st. So guess what? It already started by the time I recorded this. And we'll target I-75 from the Ohio River in Covington to the I-275 interchange in Erlinger, Kentucky. The campaign will run through September 30th, 2020. So don't think it's September 30th and they're, you know, they're late getting started for the whole year. Police say that the enhanced enforcement is meant to combat a, quote, unacceptable high rate of crashes per year, quote, on the interstate. From their press release, quote, 
the region is experiencing substantial growth with the increased volume of global commercial businesses expanding their footprint near the greater Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport. Too many people have been killed and injured in traffic crashes, end quote. Officers participating in the increased patrols will be on the lookout for aggressive driving or dangerous driving violations committed by both passenger and, of course, commercial vehicle drivers. These violations include speeding, unsafe lane changes, distracted driving, and following too closely. In other words, that's called tailgating, you know? When you can't see, or you can see somebody's doggone seal on the back of their trailer doors, or you can't read the license plate of their trailer, guess what? You're a little bit too effing close, okay? And I hope you spread my shows out to Every truck driver that you know, and maybe some of these foreign nationals will hear the doggone thing and figure it out. You're not in your country anymore, so quit frickin' tailgating and driving like a damn idiot. Back to the article. We received numerous complaints about too many motorists and truckers on I-75 driving recklessly and or too fast for conditions, end quote. Covington Police Chief told Rob Nader, Or, or, excuse me, I just can't do this this morning. Covington Police Chief Rob Nader said, quote, We can reduce these complaints and accidents they cause through enforcement. Through the program from the Kentucky Office of Highway Safety, Covington Police will work with sister agencies to make sure our families get to where they're going safely, end quote. Officers with Covington, Erlinger, Fort Mitchell, and Kenton County Police Departments will be teaming up with Kentucky State Police for the year-long effort. The campaign is funded by the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet's Office of Highway Safety and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA. Okay, a question swirled around a driver that was shot dead in his truck, semi truck in Texas. This was reported on September 23rd. Texas police are asking the public for help in investigating the death of a semi truck driver in late August that they provide a few details about the crime. On Monday, September 23rd, Midland County Sheriff's Office shared a Facebook post asking for help in investigating suspected murder of a truck driver. The post reads, quote, Midland County Sheriff's Office and Midland Crime Stoppers needs your help on homicide that was committed in Midland County. On August 23rd, at approximately 9 a.m., deputies responded to the 4100 block of East County Road 63 in reference to a medical call where a male was found unconscious. Upon arrival, deputies located the victim in a sleeper of a semi-truck and determined he was deceased with a couple of gunshot wounds in the chest. Investigators are currently working this case as a homicide. You think? Midland Crime Stoppers is offering up a $2,500 cash reward for information leading to the arrest of those involved. Uh, Call 694-TIPS. You may also have a secure tip line on MidlandCrimeStoppers.com. You remain anonymous because no caller has ever used their name, they mean. Police provided no additional information about the identity of the truck driver or any suspected motive for the shooting. Um, They do not give an area code, so I would go, if you have have any, if you're on Midland, Texas, and around that East County Road 63 in Midland County, I'm not sure where that is, around August 23rd, um, go on MidlandCrimeStoppers.com and report any tips. And here's some good news. A driver pulling doubles makes a heart-stopping save. And this is reported September 24th. A truck driver makes a miraculous save after losing control of the back trailer. Um, This was captured Southeastern Freeway in Adelaide and shared by, I guess was this out of... Australia, I think. So in this video, you can see where the truck veered off at the left shoulder. In other words, he caught the edge of the road of the left shoulder. Um, he appears to hit both the curb and a light pole, but the driver manages to keep the truck upright, avoid hitting a car to the right of the truck, and even to activate his hazard lights all at the same time. The truck driver, the truck 
tires have returned safely to the roadway. So yeah, he will, looks like he was pulling a set of long doubles in the back trailer, because I can't get the video to come up. Um, the, the back trailer came up off the ground. So, you know, he caught the left shoulder of the road on a four-lane highway in the curb. And, yeah, but who knows? Even though he, he saved it, why did he do that to begin with? You know, you got to wonder. So as truck drivers, you know, we all know what it's like to be stuck in floodwaters, stuck at a shipper or receiver's. And have to wait to be loaded for hours on end. Am I right? So especially, you know, the produce coolers or with all this weather going nuts. That's why you need to be prepared with extra food in your truck. My Patriot Supply helps you stay prepared. Now it's not what you may be thinking. My Patriot Supply is delicious emergency food. They have food kits that are good up to 25 years. They come in a slimline, waterproof tote. That you can easily store in your food pantry or under your bunk. I can speak from experience. After living through Hurricane Katrina. And for those people that are dealing with all of these storms and everything going on. We were without power for 10 days. Or you're stranded in a truck stop and can't get out of your truck to get food. If it weren't for the MREs that were flown into us, we wouldn't have had any food. Four 60-foot pine trees broke in half during that storm and landed across my driveway and landlocked me in. So I couldn't get out to get food. And there were four-mile gas lines. And just recently, my brother and sister-in-law went through that devastating uh, tornado back in July. And they were without power for a week. That's when my Patriot Supply emergency food would have came in handy. If I knew then what I know now about my Patriot Supply, I would have definitely have some stockpiled in my pantry before that storm hit. I have some in under my bunk, and the food is delicious. You have breakfast, lunches, and dinners. Now, for a limited time, you can get a one-week supply of food in a handy and neat-looking ammo can for just $39. I mean, you spend 20 bucks at a restaurant. You know, yeah, you Walmart food, but if your refrigerator isn't working or you can't run your truck all the time to keep the refrigerator working or the food goes bad, this stuff doesn't go bad. It's good for 25 years. And they even have gluten-free food for just under $100. So in order to find out what I'm talking about, just go to my website, juliastruckedcafe.com, across the the top menu bar you'll see emergency food supply click on that you scroll down to any of the pictures and you can order just order yourself an ammo can you don't have to order a couple hundred bucks worth but i would keep it stocked up you could st- keep it stocked up at home and keep replenishing the stuff in your side box you know it's not going to go bad and ammo can is only 39 dollars to give it a try and it's breakfast lunch and dinner for a week you can't beat it you insure your car and you buy health insurance and vision and dental, why don't you buy food insurance? Stay prepared for the flooding, the bad weather. Now winter is coming. I'm going to be redoing, not redoing my show, but reposting my show about what you need to carry in your truck for when, before winter hits. To get yourself prepared, now is the time to order your My Patriot Supply food kit. Excuse me. So you can have food in your side box. Now roads are going to be closed, not because of flooding, but because of snow and bad weather and everything and high wind warnings and stuff in Wyoming. You need to carry food in your truck and other supplies. So go to juliastruckatcafe.com and click on the emergency food supply tab and order yours today. Do it, man. Do it now. Do it today. So let's get back to the news. A truck driver arrested after dozens of illegal immigrants discovered in his hot trailer. Another one. I remember a month back I was reporting on the same thing. Border Patrol agents say that they discovered dozens of illegal immigrants in a trailer of a truck in Texas around the middle of September. Discovery was made on September 17th on Highway 35 north of Laredo. Authorities say that a tractor trailer that appeared to have a single occupant passed through a checkpoint. A canine unit alerted, alerted to the presence of concealed human narcotics and the semi-truck was referred for a secondary inspection. 
When agents looked inside the trailer, they discovered 53 people from Mexico, Ecuador, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras who were reportedly illegally inside the U.S. Though the temperature inside the trailer was 105 degrees, agents say that no one needed medical attention. All 53 people inside the trailer and the truck driver, who was a U.S. citizen, were arrested and processed. The semi-truck was seized. This is not the first time that smuggling humans across the border in a hot trailer has made the headlines. Yeah, back in April, a Florida-based truck driver was sentenced to life in prison after 80 legal immigrants in the trailer of his truck were discovered dead from heat-related illnesses. Well, that's murder right there. And... The FBI, now in another story, FBI believes that a Russian immigrant could be hiding as a truck driver or a dispatcher. The FBI has offered a cash reward for an Ohio man who they believe may be working in the trucking industry. September 19 news release from the FBI is offering a reward of $5,000 for information leading to the arrest of 34-year-old Izmir Ali Kolk. The FBI says that... Cope was in, convicted on hate crime charges after beating a man he believed to be Jewish outside a Cincinnati, Ohio restaurant in February 2017. Authorities say that Cope was ordered for to self-surrender to a prison in West Virginia on August 16th, but failed to report. Are you kidding me? You're going to ask him nicely to report and give himself up? Yeah, like he's going to, you bunch of dumb bunnies. After Coke failed to report to serve his prison sentence, the FBI says that an indictment was filed in the U.S. District Court, Southern District of Ohio, Western Division, Cincinnati, for failure to surrender for service of sentences ordered by the court, and a federal arrest warrant was issued on September 4th. And now they're ch- trying to chase him down. Yeah, good luck with that. Coke is described as 5'8", 143 to 160 pounds, brown eyes and brown hair. He speaks Russian, a dialect of Turkish and English. Coke has dual U.S. and Russian citizenship, and his previous residences include Huber Heights at Dayton, Ohio, as well as Holmesk, Kranzadar, Russia. Well, guess what? He hauled ass to Russia. The FBI says that Coke is, uh, Coke is familiar with the, excuse me that Coke is familiar with the trucking industry and believe that he may be working as either a dispatcher or a truck driver. FBI warns that Coke could be considered armed and dangerous. There is pictures on the bottom of this article that'll be in the show notes. If you have any information that could lead to his arrest, you are asked to call FBI Cincinnati Field Office. So, yeah, he's uh, mo- their most wanted. One of their most wanted. California Highway Patrol uses Facebook to shame a DUI driver, truck driver, Draval- I just cannot talk. Y'all laughing at me? Truck driver involved in two hit and runs. Brilliant. California Highway Patrol shared a Facebook post about a truck driver's DUI arrest as a warning to anyone else who might be considering getting behind the wheel while under the influence. On September 24th, the Bakersfield Division of California Highway Patrol took to Facebook to share information about the unnamed truck driver's arrest. Quote, Honestly, Ossifer, I only had two. End quote. The driver of this big rig could have caused a lot of damage with the potential of loss of life or serious injuries. He was involved in two separate hit and run collisions with other motorists. Fortunately, no one was hurt and he was arrested for DUI. Please think twice before getting behind the wheel after drinking alcohol. No excuses. Well, yeah, let's see. Hmm, He's wearing a hoodie and basketball shorts and he's not that old either. Several members of the trucker community commented on the post to point out that drinking while driving professionally can be a recipe for a disaster. Uh, Petra says, great job and thanks for getting him off the road from another truck driver. Joshua, as a CDL driver, I see more alcohol-related crashes than most and it always breaks my heart. Good on you. No excuse for drinking and driving. Jason, I don't understand, as a truck driver of 26 years, the urge to drink and drive, that has never hit me. I guess I value people's lives more than that. And Jose, real CDL drivers don't drink and drive or do any drugs while behind the wheel too much on the line. A court 
In other news, a court upholds a $14,000 overweight fine for a trucker who followed his GPS. And guess what town this came out of? Hellertown. I thought that was kind of funny. In Pennsylvania. A Pennsylvania court has ruled against a truck driver is accused of driving a 30-ton truck on a 6-ton weight limit road. Pennsylvania Superior Court ruled against the 40-year-old semi-truck driver, Mr. Aikens, and upheld the $14,250 fine he was issued for driving an overweight truck on a roadway in Hellertown back in June of 2018. He appealed to the state Superior Court after the judge in Hampton County refused to avoid his fine. Aikens, who represented himself at Superior Court, argued that he had a local traffic exemption from the weight limit on Northampton Street as he had picked up a load on another nearby road. Aikens also argued that his GPS directed him to the Northampton Road to access I-78. The court ultimately rejected both arguments and upheld the fine. His local, the court said his local pickup did not require him to drive on Northampton Road. The bill of lading for his Easton Road pickup did not serve as a permit to drive wherever he wanted to or wherever his GPS told him to go after making his pickup with utter disregard for posted weight restrictions. He had an obligation to avoid the restricted road via a reasonable alternative route. He failed to do so. Good on you. You can't always listen to your GPS. You got you, you know the you can't just oh there's a weight limit sign I can't go on that highway. You know, they're gonna nab ya. I, I see that down by my house all the time. There it's a weight li- weight restricted street. You know, I go down that street because I live there, but mainly I go around and I could come in the other way. But there's a lot of log trucks that go down my road all the time and it's weight restricted. They don't go down it empty, they go down the damn thing loaded. But anyway, back to the news. Um, so, a few days later, remember I just told you about that Houston Bridge being closed because barges were hitting it? Well, about a, five days later, the bridge reopens. So the Texas DOT announced that the bridge damaged by barges that came loose has partially reopened after several days of closure. On the 25th of September, they announced that the two eastbound lanes and two westbound lanes on I-10 bridge over San Jacinto River near Houston were now open. The drivers should still expect delays due to crews making repairs. It was closed on the... So about five days it was shut down. So remember last weekend, everybody... uh, And I reported on Facebook that the first snow of the season was going to happen up in the higher elevations of Montana and end up hitting in Oregon. So this next story relates to that. Historic weekend blizzard brought multiple feet of snow making travel treacherous or impossible. Some areas of Montana, they're warning you, could see more than three feet of snow. We barely entered the fall, but forecast is already predicting a major winter weather event for the weekend. Weather watchers say that a storm storm system is likely to hit portions of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming starting late Friday and lasting through the weekend. It end up hitting Oregon. The greatest amount of snowfall is predicted to occur near north and central parts of Montana, where at least a foot of snow accumulation is probable, and multiple feet of snow are possible in some areas. The blizzard could also bring wind gusts of up to 40 miles an hour to the area. So there again, a lot of times I apologize for being so late on this stuff, but stay tuned and you will hear the reason why I was so damn late this week. This early season winter storm and or blizzard has the potential to set a new benchmark for snow accumulations, cold temperatures, and resulting impacts for parts of the northern Rockies and the Rocky Mountain Front, said the U.S. National Weather Service. Great Falls wrote, extreme impacts are possible with the storm, including power infrastructure, down power lines, resu- resulting in widespread power outages, agricultural interests, outdoor recreation, camping and such. You know, just stay the hell out of the... When when we get a a storm warning like that, stay the hell out of the area. Keep posted to Facebook um, because as soon as I see stuff like this uh, or hear about it, I try to post it on our Facebook page, Julia's Truck and Cafe Facebook page. So, and on Twitter. 
So, you know, stay tuned for that. And in other news, Iowa authorities warned truck drivers not to trust the GPS when looking for flood detours. This guy went through an 11-foot tunnel and pretty much took off the top of his top of the trailer. Iowa transportation officials are warning truck drivers of the consequences of trusting their GPS devices while looking for ways around it near the state closure. Floodwaters in western Iowa have shut down portions of I-29 and I-680 over the past several days, forcing some truckers off their normal routes and into some tight squeezes. And this was reported on September 26th. Now, that's been going on in, in Iowa and Missouri. I-29 have been shut down, oh, man, for like months back in spring. So I guess it's happening again. Both the Iowa State Patrol and the Iowa Department of, De- uh, Department of Transportation have shared photos of semi-trucks stuck under bridges because drivers reportedly follow their GPS devices and not approve detour routes and signage. So don't read the signs anymore. Just glare in front. Don't turn your head. God forbid, because you could snap your neck off your shoulders. Yeah, I'm being facetious here. And if you don't know what the word means, look it up. You know, don't turn your head. Don't look at the orange signs. This is detour. And you can, uh, if you want to access the most up-to-date travel information from the Iowa Department of Transportation, they have a link here in the article. That'll be, again, be in the show notes. And sad news, a truck driver perishes after a slab of stone falls off the truck and crushes him. A truck driver lost his life on the 25th of September when a large piece of stone that he was hauling fell off of his truck at a business in Dallas. The incident happened around 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday, September 25th at a commercial residential stone retailer called Infinity Stone in Dallas. Authorities say that a flatbed truck driver was delivering a load of stone to the business when a at least one large slab of stone fell off the truck and onto the driver as he stood outside his vehicle. Dallas Fire and Rescue were called to the scene and found the truck driver deceased at the scene, um, you think? So far, police have released few details about the incident, which remains under investigation. At that time, the identity of the truck driver was not released, I'm sure, due to notifying next of kin. Police have also not provided information on what caused the stone to fall off the truck. They're probably still investigating it at that time. All right, so here is a good topic that will probably get some debate. Can you bypass the scales when the traffic is backed up? Now, in some states, it is, and there again, that's why you look at signs, it does say, I said in some states, it does say bypass scale when ramp is full, but only where those signs are posted. Just because you see it in Tennessee doesn't mean you could do it in Missouri or Illinois or someplace else that doesn't have that sign. Okay? You can't just take it for granted that you could bypass the scales when the ramp is full because you've seen it in one state and that means that all 50 states have it. That's not true. California Highway Patrol recently stirred up a social media media firestorm with a Facebook post about the legality of bypassing a scale house when traffic is backed up. On the 26th, the Donner Pass Division wrote this, quote, We are getting lots of questions about the legality of bypassing the scales because traffic is backed up onto the freeway. We do our best to monitor traffic and shut down the scales when traffic is backed up. However, there is no NO provision in California vehicle code that allows the driver to make the decision to bypass the scales because of traffic. In capital letters in bold, you are required to enter the scale in California regardless of traffic conditions. I know many of you uh, strongly disagree with this. If you bypass the scales, you could be cited for a violation, which is a misdemeanor and be fined. So, according to California, Donner Pass, you cannot bypass if the scales are open unless you get the green light with the pre-pass, if you have one. And they have the pre-pass on. So, be warned. Can't say I haven't done my trucking driving cafe duty by not warning y'all. So, 
In other news, truckers paying attention kept this distracted driving crash from turning deadly. There's a I, We have a lot of news this week, so just bear with me. The Iowa Department of Transportation shared footage of a suspected distracted driving multi-vehicle crash that could have been much worse had the truckers behind the crash not been paying attention. In the video clip, Apparently, a distracted motorist fails to notice slow traffic and plows into the cars ahead, appearing to send them into the trailer of a stopped semi-truck. The truckers in the traffic behind the crash have only moments to react, but they manage to move over into the other lane and bring their trucks to a stop, preventing what could have been a deadly crash. The agency wrote, taking your eyes off the road just for a few seconds can result in this. Miraculously, no one was seriously injured in this crash last Friday on the uh September 20th on US 20 near Waterloo, but it's a wake-up call for all of us to put your phone away and pay attention to what's ahead of you. Yeah, it was a Schuster truck that was involved. Uh, the uh, cra- uh, car crashed by- in behind him, and um, trucks coming up behind him at least hit the left lane and were able to stop. So kudos to them. Now, a sky- get this. A skydiver was killed after plummeting in onto a semi-trailer. Now, see, all the good stuff happened to California. Why is that? California police say that a skydiver lost her life yesterday after she crashed into a semi-truck. The incident happened around 2.15 in the afternoon on Thursday, September 26th on southbound Highway 99 in Lodi, California. According to... California Highway Patrol, the unidentified 28-year-old woman was skydiving with a group from the Lodi Parachute Center when she strayed off course during her descent. The woman crashed into the trailer of a semi-truck then fell onto the shoulder of the roadway. She was pronounced dead at the scene. All of the other members of the skydiving group were able to reach the ground unharmed. Windy conditions reported in the area at the time of the fatal incident. Car hauler Rick Costa said that he'd seen several other skydivers over Highway 99 prior to that incident. I never thought it was very safe. The way they do it, they actually fly over the freeway and come back to grass when they land. And CHP and the Federal Aviation Administration are investigating the woman's death. Between 1999 and 2018, 16 people have died jumping from planes at the Lodi Parachute Center. The incident caused heavy traffic backups on Highway 99, but all lanes were reopened by 6.30 that evening. So, our condolences to that woman's family. So, here is an update to, remember I just talked about the llama being bit in the, in the balls? Well, here's an update to that story. Yes, of course there's a video of that time that a truck driver bit the camel because it sat on her. This week, the bizarre tale of the Florida trucker's encounter with a camel, I'm sorry, not a llama, a camel, my bad, sorry guy, at a Louisiana truck stop went viral and now surveillance video of the incident has surfaced. In case you missed it, the incident occurred on Thursday, September 19th at the Tiger Truck Stop off of I-10 in Grosset, Louisiana. See, for years and years and years, they used to have Bengal tigers, and now they they also have camels. And I didn't, they didn't have camels when I went down there years ago. The incident began, just refresh your memory, the incident began when a Florida-based truck driver and her husband stopped at the truck stop to allow their deaf dog out of the truck. Long story short, the dog got into Casper the camel's enclosure. The truck driver and her husband went in after it. The camel sat on the woman and she escaped from the animal by biting its testicles. The woman was taken to the hospital for treatment of unknown injuries and Casper was prescribed antibiotics to treat the trucker bite. I would have bit her ass back. Like I said, as the story went viral nationwide, many people suggested there must be video of the freak encounter, and turns out they were right. And if you are, you know, I can put this in stupid things that drivers do, Paige. I will share, if I can share that video, I'll share it. Otherwise, you could find it in the article. I have a link to it in the show notes. And the show notes, you can either find them. Um, under the show notes tab, under the cafe menu, or if you look up this episode, uh, this week's episode for the, um, it'll be to the September 30th episode, 
you can go ahead and there's a link. I try to put the link in the description on the website for the show notes. Or on our YouTube channel, you can find it. A truck driver rams a car down the road in a wild video. This was reported on September 27th. A Facebook user shared a video clip of a truck driver nudging a car down the road. The video was shared on Thursday by Facebook user and Massachusetts resident uh, Mr. Litchfield. Litchfield captured the video when they brake check you, but you call their bluff. The video had been viewed more than 38,000 times in 24 hours. You could take a look at the clip below. Yeah, don't be brake checking me because I'll push your ass down the highway. I ain't got a problem doing it. I got a deer guard on the front of my truck. Don't have no problem doing it. It's a big blue truck rolling down the highway. Don't do it. All right, in other news, Texas police say they arrested a serial roadside shooter suspect. And three of the four shooting incidents have been taking place on or near I-20. Um, police in Texas announced that they are on the lookout for a possible serial shooter who appears to be targeting drivers in broken down vehicles. On Friday, September 27th, the Ector County Sheriff's Office held a press conference to warn the public about the suspected shooter following four roadside shooting incidents between Tuesday and Thursday in Odessa, Texas area. Police say that the first shooting happened just before 1 in the morning on Tuesday at 8th and Grant, and no injuries were reported. A second shooting happened around 7.30, the same day, on I-20 and 866. Again, no injuries. The third shooting was reported on Tuesday afternoon near the Pilot Club convenience store at I-20 and Meter Crater Road. Police say that a man was shot in the abdomen as he was sitting in a parked car on the side of the roadway. The man was able to drive to the Pilot Club convenience store after he was shot. He was taken to the hospital and is is expected to be okay. The fourth shooting was reported around 10.30 p.m. on Thursday between Farmers Market Road 1936 and the I-20 overpass on Business I-20. A male shooting victim was found dead at the scene. Ector County Sheriff Mike Griffiths said that each of the shootings involved someone pulling up alongside a disabled vehicle and opening fire. Police say that the suspect description was varied, but they believe the suspect is driving a white extended cab or crew cab pickup truck. Griffiths say we are actively pursuing the individual. There are multiple agencies involved. There have been different weapons used and all appear to be a from a handgun, but of different calibers. All of these incidents have been roadside related. We are asking the public to be cautious, and if you see anything suspicious, to call 911. See anything? Say something. An update to this, as of 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the same day, says that they have taken a suspect into custody in connection with the series of shootings. That's pretty much all they said. And a trucker who vanished near the Mexican border has been missing now for six weeks as of September 27th. The Laredo Police Department is asking for our help in locating a truck driver who went missing in mid-August. Police say that 50-year-old truck driver David Earl Hartke has been missing since August 14th. And this is unclear whether he went missing from Laredo, Texas or from Mexico. A family member told local news outlet that Harkey received a settlement check from a crash prior to going missing. Harkey is 5'8 and weighs approximately 170 pounds. He has brown hair and hazel eyes. Anyone with information is call, asked to call Laredo Police Department. Callers who want to remain anonymous could call Laredo Crime Stoppers at 956-727-TIPS or Laredo Police Department at 956-795-2800. Uh, David Earl Hartke. Um, yeah, I'd go missing too if I uh, got a, a check, for a, for a settlement check. Yeah going to Mexico and live like a king. But anyway, um, I'm sure his family is worried not to not to make light of that situation. I'm sure the family is worried about him and just want to make sure that he's okay. And in other news, a truck driver, quote, not familiar with the area, crashes into two build crashes through two buildings, not into two buildings. He went through two buildings. Oi, come on, guys. I read these stories week after week about all these crashes and stuff. And I only get like, you saw this this episode, maybe one story of a good Samaritan or something, somebody doing good, and the rest is nothing but stupidity. I'm like, God. <sighs> Indiana police are investigating after a semi-truck 
driver drove through two buildings causing, quote, significant property damage, you think? The incident happened just after 4 a.m. on Thursday in Butlerville, Indiana, when a semi-truck left the roadway and drove through two unoccupied buildings along U.S. Highway 50 that used to house the Campbell Township Volunteer Fire Department. Well, thank goodness, you know, it wasn't a residential home. Talk about, you know, a wake-up call. In spite of the amount of damage that was caused by the crash, only minor minor injuries were reported. Yeah, to the stupid truck driver, probably. Oh, my God. Campbell Township Volunteer Fire Department Chief Don Beale told Weekly that Quote, that is a real hazard with that location. The road is straight for probably four miles, and there's a curve about an eighth of a mile down the road. And if you continue straight, it's a straight shot toward the firehouse, end quote. The cause of the crash is being investigated by Jennings County Sheriff's Office. Drugs and alcohol aren't thought to be a factor, but police are considering whether speed could have played a part in the crash. Um, If you take down a building, you know, if it's not drugs, they're not drunk. They're not shooting up anything. Um, yeah, they're going too freaking fast. Slow the F down, people. Come on. You don't own the goddamn interstate. You don't own the roadway. A uh, certain bull hauler that I had, did not, I had the misfortune of running into uh, the other day. Anyway, I digress. Texas police found dozens of illegal immigrants in a refer, refrigerated trailer. And I think this is a continuation of that other story. Police in Laredo, Texas said they discovered more than 40 undocumented... This is another story, excuse me. Uh, More than 40 undocumented immigrants inside a semi-trailer while conducting an enhanced patrol. The immigrants were discovered just before 11 p.m. on September 20th while officers with the Laredo Police Department were participating in an enforced effort called Operation Stone Garden. In conjunction with U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, uh, according to Laredo Police Department, new release, officers approached a semi-truck parked on the side of the road at Tejas Loop. While inspecting the contents of the refrigerated trailer, officers discovered 41 illegal immigrants concealed inside. So in September, they caught two semi-trucks with almost 100 illegal immigrants coming over the border. Yeah, besides the thousands upon thousands that are rushing the border. Police say the immigrants were in relatively good condition and that no one needed medical attention. Border Patrol was called in to assist and all 41 people were taken to immigration. Hector Hernandez Trejo, he was 37, was arrested and faces 39 counts of human smuggling and two counts of smuggling persons under the age of 8. That's called child trafficking. So, now here's a hell of a picture. A massive engine explosion was caught on camera at a local truck pull. In Wisconsin, spectators at a truck pull competition got a little more than they bargained for when one of the competitors had an engine explode and sent the hood of the truck flying. The incident was caught on video at, right around Labor Day at the Curd Capital Fall Nationals Truck and Tractor Pull in Ellsworth, Wisconsin. They're a little late with reporting this because of the end of September when she's reporting this. Black Sheep Pulling Team shared the video of the incident on their Facebook page. The driver behind the wheel during the engine explosion wrote po- on the post, quote, I knew immediately from the sound of the pop that I split the block. However, the windshield was covered in oil, so I didn't know the extent of the damage until I got out of the truck. Both prior times we split the block, the top half half barely moved. Right around the 2 minute 25 mark, I got out the passenger side of the cab and you could see my reaction. I had no idea that the hood had gone flying and I actually thought that he ran it over at first. So a second or two later, you could see me notice the hood. Despite the violence of the explosion, no injuries were reported. And it's a woman driver that blew the motor. So wait a minute. Do you think you're doing it a little bit too hard, Brenda? If you crack the block on two separate trucks? Just a question. And finally, a truck driver gets a good lesson in why you don't drive into high water. A 
trucker tries to take a flooded roadway and fails miserably. Facebook user Brad Mack shared the video of a truck driver's foolhardy attempt to plow through floodwaters in Boos, Arizona on September 23rd. And there's a video with this article as well. Now, I greatly, greatly appreciate all of you who tune in and listen to me each and every week. If you are new to the cafe and you you found me via my business card because you met me out here on the road in person and you would like to check me out or the radio show out before I put my foot in my mouth, um, at the bottom of every podcast episode on the website at Julia's Trucker Cafe and also where else you could find me, Paige, there are links that I've listed where you could find me on iHeartRadio or YouTube or Apple Podcasts or many more. Um, SoundCloud, Spreaker, um, TuneIn. Um, we also have a Facebook page, so don't forget to like us there and join our discussion group at Julia Truck and Cafe Regulars. On the website, I under everything is under Cafe Menu and the Cafe Hub. On the homepage, I have even a little quick video tour to where you could find everything. So if you kind of forget, there or oh, the video that you can look and see where everything's at. But pretty much the hub of everything is under like a restaurant, a cafe menu. Under that, I share videos of cooking in your truck and I do a few cooking videos. I'm going to be doing more of those in the future. And I have new and upcoming things in the future as well. So stay tuned. Um, if you would like to get your the articles that I talk about in your inbox, in your email, subscribe to our email list that's on the bottom of every podcast episode on every page and I'll send you send you the show notes right to your inbox this way you don't got to keep coming back to the website but I'm glad that you do in the future I have new things coming out like I mentioned and if you're on the email list you'll have priority in getting those new things that are in the works and before I forget don't be afraid, be afraid to leave a comment. Do you like the show? Not like the show? What I can do differently? Do I rattle on too much? You know, um, I read each and every one, good and bad. I take all your comments. I can do constructive criticism. If you have any upcoming ideas for any upcoming shows, please feel free to email me. My email is info at juliastruckatcafe.com. If you enjoy my work, and would like to support me, you can support the show. It does cost me um, every month to put the show on with um, advertising, with also uploading. Uh, I have to do a separate, besides um, the cost for the website, and I have another site that I upload the podcast to that's a hosting for the podcast that all costs so if you would like i would really appreciate if you'd like to be a sponsor there is a link to my patreon account that you could be a sponsor of three five or ten dollars a month uh just minimal Uh, i'm not asking you know for hundreds of dollars but you know any any little bit that you would like to support me would greatly help i greatly would greatly appreciate it you would definitely get kudos you also would have access to me personally in my discord group which is a private chat area that um, you will have access to. So it's only to my Patreon subscribers. If you only want to do a one-time uh, support, you can also send me a, a paypal.me link to Julia's Truck and Cafe. You could just send a one-time donation. Any little thing would help. I would greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm not begging, but it's just to do, defer costs so I could keep this show going because right now I'm paying for all of it. So to keep, you know, to keep the show free, um, I'm also looking for sponsors and stuff as well. But um, and so if you want to be a sponsor to the show and you get kudos for it, um, there's a my Patreon or a Patreon link in the description below, also on the YouTube channel. So until next week, thank you so much for listening. I, like I said, I greatly appreciate it. Oh, before I forget, I, I did tell you um, that I was going to tell you how my week was. So before I forget and end the show, um, Monday, and I'm sorry I'm doing a lot of ums. Uh, my, Monday, I 
was loading and unloaded in, let's see, went to Springdale, Oklahoma, Ponk City, Oklahoma, and I went back to Springdale, Arkansas to get loaded. Well, nobody told me that the appointment time was 7 o'clock, so the broker lied. I didn't, I was still loaded, didn't get unloaded in Oklahoma till 6.30 that night from a 9 o'clock in the morning appointment. So this is for all the newbie drivers, this little story, to show you no matter how long you've been out here, crap like this happens. I'm not trying to cry in my coffee, but crap like this happens. So I didn't get loaded till I was 10 hour break at my receiver to get unloaded. I got detention time for it. Well, then I had to hurry over to Springdale. I didn't get to Springdale till 10.30 that night. They told me they were going to load unload till uh, midnight. Um, but when I got there and checked in with the shipping office, no, it's too late. So we're going to go ahead and hold you over till the next morning. Okay. I didn't get loaded Tuesday till two o'clock in the afternoon. And this load was going from Springdale to Denver, another 775 miles away. So, all right, I get loaded at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday. Beat feet to Denver. I get to Denver, 2 o'clock mountain time. I check in. Nobody tells me this. I check in. Oh, your appointment's not till 7 o'clock that night. Another six hours of waiting. I spent a total of 24 hours, if not longer, waiting on that load. One load, two and a half days. I mean, it's ridiculous. Just r- freaking ridiculous. Now, the next load was easy. Ran over, went to uh, a little town in Nebraska, loaded 11 pallets, ran over, uh, talk about in the middle of a cornfield in Kansas, found that place, a little ag place in the middle of Kansas. Then I get run up to Salina, Kansas. I usually uh, normally load pizza. And uh, pick up my load early in Kansas, then spend two and a half hours on the interstate because somebody was driving too fast. They tagged the car, jackknifed the truck, and flipped it on its side. And it was hauling hazardous materials. Bull ammunition, I guess. You know, from uh, uh, Fort Riley or to Fort Riley. So that shut down eastbound I 70. And I saw the truck, and yeah, it was skidded. It wasn't broke open, but it was skidded all the way across. But I'm sure they had to uh, unload it. Six hours. That interstate was shut down for over six hours. They were rerouting people. So, yeah, that was my week in a nutshell. I hope yours was better. So, until next time, keep the shiny side up. Slow your asses down in bad weather. I don't have to teach you. I ain't your mama. Turn on your headlights. Use your turn signals. I know, by the way, I'm starting to tell people, you know how to flip people off by using your middle finger. Why don't you reach down with the same finger and turn your turn signal on? It goes up and it goes down. You could use the same turn signal real quick to flip people off, but don't you forget how to use a turn signal, how lazy our society has become. But have a great week. (laughs) 